<laughs> there actually is some interesting truth to that. <laughs> um, okay, so last time we talked about uh, arrays versus array lists, right? Remind me, what's the difference between those guys? And by the way, if you haven't noticed, we have the code up on these screens now. Go ahead. Correct. Yeah, well, if you, there's one part in uh, that I mentioned last class where it says that an array list, what it does is, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about how it works under the hood too much, but an array list, what it does is it allocates more space. You know, kind of says, here's a bunch of space that we're going to allocate contiguously. Mm -hmm. And then once you run out of that, we're going to magically make sure you can add more stuff. Now, there's two different implementations for array lists. You can either say, well, I'm going to create a pointer here that points to the next section of the array list somewhere else in memory where we're going to allocate some space that you can start filling. And then when you run out of that, we're going to have a pointer which goes to another space in memory, which allocates more, kind of gives you a buffer that you can start filling up. The other thing, um, and I'm not sure which way Java actually implements it, but you know, the other thing you can do is they'll just give you an initial cluster and just say, here's a bunch of contiguous memory, start filling it up. As soon as you get to the end of that, what it'll do is it'll destroy that, create new memory that's, let's call it twice as long or something like that, um, and update the pointer. So from your perspective, you don't necessarily know that something, something destructive happened under the hood. You're just adding and removing stuff from the array list. But from the programmer's perspective, it grows elastically. So you can just keep adding stuff to it, adding stuff to it, and you don't care what kind of mayhem is happening under the hood. Um, so in the book, which which of those two implementations do they imply? One of the two has to be there. I think they just said array lists were contiguous and they said the contiguous were using the pointers. And it sounds like you're saying array lists is both contiguous and pointers. Well, Everything in Java that has a capital letter on it will use a, a pointer to get to the very beginning of it. So if they're saying that array lists are always contiguous, then it's that second implementation where the array list initially gets a, uh, created, you know, the underlying construct of an array list is an array. So here, let me just draw a picture real quick of how it is very likely built in Java based on that. Because ultimately, this translates into not necessarily having a performance benefit of using an array list. It's a convenience tool. So when we create an instance of an array list, Array list. What it actually does is it's getting built on top of an array. So this array list effectively manages this array. So when we build an array list, we might say something like array list of type string, let's say. Well, let's, yeah, we'll say string. Uh, AR is equal to new array list string, something like that. So that's going to build a new array list. We haven't just we have not told that guy how many elements we in, we intend to store, right? We've just said I want an array list because I want to store stuff. So this gives us our array list. This is AR in this example, okay? And um, so this guy under the hood creates an array of a certain size. At some point, they must have done a study and decided what's the appropriate original size for an array list. Um, you know, maybe they decide, what did I create here, 10? So maybe they decide, we're going to give you 10 initial buckets, something like that. In contiguous memory, because actually the array list is just managing a traditional array. It's managing a normal plain Jane array. Now, 
Once you start filling this up and you want to add an 11th thing, the array list has to intervene. It says, you know, when you call the add function for the array list, it's going to say, oh, you want to add another value. It looks at its array and says, I don't have room for another value. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to create a, another array, presumably with different memory addresses. So for this example, let me just dump the memory addresses so we don't confuse those. They live somewhere in memory. So it's going to create another array. And maybe this one is, what do I have room for? We'll just say it's a little bit bigger. So our array list used to manage this particular array. And it had all it had this thing all filled up with stuff, let's say. Now it's going to create a new array, fill this guy up with all the stuff that was in the old one, but then give us some more runway, some additional um, memory to store more stuff. So then what we can do is it then updates the pointer of what that array list is managing. A now larger array. Um, so this is still under the hood, contiguous, it's memory in a row. Any way you cut it, if it's, if it's operating in terms of contiguous memory, it has to request memory just like an array uh, requests memory. And then what it just does is under the hood, even though this is horribly memory inefficient, you know, we just took an array that was taking up a bunch of space, we burned the house down uh, because we no longer needed it, and now we have a bigger house that we can store more stuff. And right before we burned it, we copied all our stuff over into the new house. And now we have some other rooms to move more furniture into. Something like that. Go ahead. Oh, so um, is it actually contiguous memory from the OS perspective or just from the program's perspective? So like if it goes over a page, if, will it be the next page in that page? Well, page? if you're telling me that the book described Java's array list as being contiguous memory, then what it's doing is it's managing an array under the hood. Okay. So it's a contiguous memory just like a normal array is. We just have this little guy here who's our minion who does the the, the, the dirty work for us. I just say he I just tell him I want to add a value. And he makes that happen. Whatever that means for that to happen. If he has run out of space in the underlying array he used to manage, he then creates a new array that's bigger. Now, the in, most inefficient way of doing that would be an initial array list. Uh, I, I guess it's possible they've written it this way. I would, I would think this would not be the way it would work in a modern language, but um, that you would create an initial array list that has zero, it manages a zero bucket array. The second you add something, it overwrites that array with brand new contiguous memory with a one bucket array. You add something else, it now creates new contiguous memory with a two bucket array, copies the one bucket over, and then now you have room for one more. You add something else, you add something else, You every single time you add a single element, it's giving you one more bucket in an underlying array that's having massive destruction under the hood. Because every single time we're asking for a new plot of land in memory, and we're letting Java know, you know that two bedroom house we had a couple minutes ago? Don't need it anymore. I need a three bedroom house now. Okay. And then a few minutes later, you know that three-bedroom house that I thought was going to be good enough? Nope. <laughs> I need a four-bedroom house. And you just keep asking it for more and more memory, and that memory is going to be contiguous memory somewhere else in your memory. And then after you've gotten that and you stop using the old one, that guy then gets reclaimed and can be assigned to somebody else. But that would be a pretty poor way of implementing an array list. Um, so that would be the most memory efficient uh, version of an array list if you were to only look at the final version of your array list because you would say oh it fit my data perfectly everything just fit we got lucky 
when you just didn't look down the road and just notice the destruction behind you of all the destroyed arrays um, that were, you know, you burned down these houses. I no longer need that. It no longer meets the needs that I had two seconds ago. Something like that. So more than likely, if I were implementing an array list, more than likely what it would do is it would say, look, I'm going to be a little wasteful of memory potentially. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, you know, when you create an initial array list, I'm going to give you some space. I'm going to request, it might be 10, it might be 100. They might just say, look, I'm going to grab 100 buckets of memory. Because more times than not, that's going to be enough, let's say. And then as soon as you run out of that, then they say, okay, well, that wasn't enough. We had a bad guess. We'll knock down one house and build another one. Then I'll give you more memory. Maybe it just doubles each time for all I know. Um, uh, and it's possible the, the book gave you a very specific uh, definition of how it works, but this is the way I would write it. I would say, I'm going to give you 100 buckets even if you're only going to use three of them. Because that's going to be better than me giving you one bucket and then giving you two buckets and then giving you three buckets because I have to destroy memory every single time and I'm putting a burden on the operating system. So I'll ask the operating system for a plot of land, contiguous memory, one time, say give me 100 buckets. Chances are I'm not going to fill that. So my, my array list, he just keeps track of how many elements I actually have uh, in there. Now, as soon as I run out of real estate, I say, ah, I got to suck it up. I got to build a new house. I'll just make sure I build the next one significantly bigger so that I can fit more stuff. So we're always going to have an amount of waste, but we're limiting the total amount of waste. Does that sound like what the book described? Something along those lines? It's, well, it doesn't damage the memory. What it, uh, it is unusable by other programs for a time period. So when we create this, um, so let's look at our original array list here. So our original array list is managing this 10 bucket array. So that means those 10, that the memory that was reserved, if these are integers, this is uh, 40 bytes, right? We have 40 bytes of memory. That 40 bytes of memory is reserved by the operating system for this particular variable. Nobody else is allowed to use it. Make sense? Okay, so that's 40 bytes of land that's off limits. Okay, it's my neighbor's house, so I can't do stuff on his yard. Now, all of a sudden, that exact same variable is gonna say, you know what? I now need more. So it's gonna create more memory, not in the same place that the old memory is, because we're not guaranteed you know, just like in real life, if you have a house, you're not guaranteed that you'll be able to build a much bigger house on your plot of land that you own, right? And there's no guarantee that you have an empty lot next to you. If you do, that might be convenient, but it could be that the closest plot of land is two miles away that's big enough to put your new, even bigger house. So what we would do is we would say, we're gonna go ahead and abandon this memory. And we're going to create new memory someplace else. We're going to ask the operating system to go and find us more contiguous memory that's even bigger than the old memory we have. So for a time period, what I give myself? Six extra ones. So I have 64 bytes of memory reserved here, somewhere in memory. I have 40 bytes of memory technically still reserved for me right there. So I'm using over 100 bytes of memory for a period of time. It does, yeah. So then what happens is once I'm done with that add function where I've um, updated my pointer for AR to now point to this new place, at that point, nobody is currently pointing at this memory. He's been abandoned. We've moved out of the house. We've built a house someplace else. And now we're dealing with uh, this brand new memory. Java has something called automatic garbage collection. So this is a process where a program looks for abandoned memory. What that is is memory that has zero 
pointer has a let's say has a zero pointer count, which is another way of saying no variables currently point to it. If you if I had three different variables that all pointed to the same place AR pointed to, the pointer count for that memory would be three. As those variables started pointing to other things instead, that pointer count would go down. And in my picture here, I finally fully abandoned this memory. AR used to point to it. Now I've fully moved out. I now point to a new place. AR can only hold a value. It holds a pointer, it holds a memory address. It used to hold the memory address of this dude. Now it holds the memory address of this dude. So Java keeps track of its own memory management. It's gonna go through its list. The, the, gar the truck driver, garbage truck driver is gonna go through this list and say, okay, we got this plot of land. How many people are currently pointing to it? Zero. I'm gonna bulldoze it. Done with that land. So he releases it and says, I can now assign that to somebody else. It's possibly goes through and zeros it out, kind of, you know, in uh, C, what we see a lot of times is uh, if you print out uh, memory that you don't own, if you force a uh, buffer overflow, so you walk to bucket 11 of a 10 bucket array, and if you got lucky and whatever's in bucket 11 was previously used or is even currently being used, you'll find a value is in there. Not a zero, it could be a letter, it could be some binary data, whatever it is, you're, you're gonna find something in there. Um, it doesn't belong to you. you. You've wandered into your neighbor's garage. All right, you start taking stuff, <laughs> potentially overwriting stuff, right? It's like, I'm gonna replace his hubcaps with no hubcaps. <laughs> All right, so does that make some sense? How, how that's working? No, 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 That's, these are all important things. And, and part of the weakness here is, and this is my fault, is I should have looked through the book and seen how array lists. Um, the book is an excellent book. I've had really good luck with it, but um, I kind of have everything that's Java just stored in here. So, <laughs> so I don't actually uh, look at your um, what you're reading, which is, I presume a pretty high percentage of what I talk about is very accurate for what the, is in the book. Yeah. Yeah, but do call me out if there's something that I've explained that seems to contradict the book, and I'll give you an alternate uh, explanation. Because I don't, promise I'm not making stuff up. But sometimes I'm operating off of an array list being a, probably a linked data structure where you're actually telling me the book advertises as something crappier than that. Just a convenience tool for... A programmer so that you don't have to worry about the mayhem you're leaving behind. Go ahead. Yeah, that's that's the link list thing I was talking about because um, I gave you what for today a reading thing for um, the basics of link lists. So let me connect the the dots here. I, I think actually pun intended, um, and then we'll <laughs> then we'll write some stuff. Um, so let me. Redefine array list real quick. Quick read uh, array list version two. Let's say so um, array list. So we're going to call this guy as a crappy wrapper for arrays that allows the programmer to not have to deal with memory or how much space they may require and does all of the dirty work under the hood. Out of sight, out of mind, something like that. So memory inefficient with lots of destruction, but who cares? Our computers are really fast. We have plenty of RAM and now we just don't have to deal with it as programmers. But we can still store as many things as we want and just pretend like we don't care how it's being accomplished, okay? Now your reading for today talked about linked list, right? 
So linked lists are what are known as, I'm not going to go too far into linked lists because we do spend a majority of next semester's class talking about linear and nonlinear linked data structures. But I'll give you the, 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 the highlight here, especially since you were talking about nodes. So I'll give, draw the picture. So a linked list is a linearly linked data structure. Data structures are, of course, structures for holding data. All right, so what does that mean? Data structures are unique ways of holding stuff. Last couple of classes, we've been talking about collections of things, right? Holding stuff in some sort of interesting way. We can create an array where we have to say, this is how much stuff I'm going to hold. We can create an array list where we don't have to say how much stuff we're going to hold, but under the hood, somebody cares about how much stuff we're going to hold, and it just does the dirty work for us. With a linked list, we actually create it literally with the expectation that it may never hold anything. Okay? So... A data structure in, in, in and of itself. An array is a data structure. An array list is a data structure. Uh, a linked list is a data structure. An object that we create, our fraction, technically is a data structure. We've created this object that knows how to hold a numerator and a denominator, right? It's storing data, very unique, specific pieces of data that are unique to fractions, right? So data structures are very much a, um, an abstract term that just talks about structures for holding data. All right, in the next class, we're gonna talk about linear and nonlinear uh, data structures. So we're gonna think, talk about things that come from linked lists and we're gonna talk about things that come from trees, tree data structures, um, which have multiple nodes coming off. So now that gets us to this thing when we talk about nodes. So a linked list is gonna look like this. We have a node that might have a value in it. All right, and this is in some place in memory. So let's say this is memory address 22, and we've keyed our memory as being red, right? And we've keyed the values as being blue. Okay. we're going to have a, a 5 stored in memory address 71. And what happens is this first node has a pointer that points to the location of the next node. The next guy, maybe we're storing a 12, and this is that bucket... Um, 101, let's say. This guy has a pointer that points to the next node. So this is very similar to us having an array of three elements. So an array would look like this. where we have a variable AR, and this guy points to the beginning of contiguous memory, all right? And we have three buckets of contiguous memory. The way we would have built this array is int array AR is equal to a new int array three. Whereas this guy here, maybe we'll call this guy LL, And we're going to say LL points to the beginning of my linked list. And we would have built this guy this way. We would have said um, linked list LL is equal to new linked list. Like that. All right, so with AR, we are requesting a fixed amount of memory, enough memory to hold three of three integers. All right, and it's giving me contiguous memory 
It's giving me a plot of land big enough to hold three integers, whether I put three integers in there or not. Okay, so we're gonna say this is fast because now we can calculate. We talked last time about calculating to get into the individual buckets. If I wanna to get to bucket two of this, I start off at the base address 16. I add to it two times the size of an int, which is four. Two times four is eight. That gets me to bucket 24. 16 plus eight is 24. All right, we could just go there. Now with a linked list, we initially create it and it literally points nowhere. We have an empty list. Then I say, here I'll, I'll move some of my, oh, Ninja. <laughs> All right, you didn't see that. Good. All right, so when I originally create my link list, it looks like this. Then when I say ll.add1, add a one, it's gonna create a brand new node and it's gonna make ll point to that node. But now that node has a next pointer that points nowhere, just like ll used to point nowhere. Now, a few minutes later, I add a five to my link list. So I get a five, we're asking for a new node somewhere in memory. It happens to assign me memory address 71. I then let my previous node know about the location of the new node so I can get there. And my new node points to nothing. I then, a couple minutes later, say I wanna add a 12. I get brand new memory for storing my 12. This is at memory address 101 in our example. <laughs> and I make the previous node point at that guy. So in this case, I'm storing a one, a five, and a 12, just like I'm capable of storing in a, in a normal array. But if I wanna store another value in this array, I have to destroy this entire array and get myself a four bucket array that I can now go and fill it back up with my three things and then put the fourth thing in there. Whereas if I wanna put a fourth thing in my linked list, I just say, hey, give me a new element. I'm gonna store, um, I don't know, a, a, a 16. And uh, this guy is, I'll just go ahead and tack him on to the end of my array and he's at some memory location um we just make it up in fact he might have even gotten a memory location much earlier in memory we we don't know we just ask the operating system give me ram for a node and then i will let the previous node know about where the next node lives so to find if i want to this is you know if we think about this like an array this is bucket zero this is bucket one this is bucket two this is bucket three if I want to get to bucket two of this or of this link list, I have to start at the beginning of the link list, knock on that person's door and say, where does your neighbor live? Where's your closest neighbor? Follow that road, because it's probably not next door, to this next guy. Knock on his door. Where does your neighbor live? Where's the next guy in this list? Where does he live? Follow that road. Get me there knock on his door, so on and so forth. Finally, I get to this guy, knock on the door, say, where does your next neighbor, neighbor live? I don't have one. End of the road, we're at the end of the list. So we would say that this guy is slow in terms of performance, because we have to traverse the list one element at a time to get to any individual place, because we can't just calculate the location in memory of where it lives contiguous memory allows, gives us the benefit of being able to calculate where the next bucket is, but it doesn't give us the flexibility of just adding an element. Or in this case, if I wanna delete an element, I can get rid of this guy and just have this guy now point to there. I've downsized. And now my memory usage is still exactly the right size for what I'm trying to store. That makes sense? So we would call 
this right here a node and a linked list is a bunch of nodes linked together. Go ahead. So the issue with an array list is that adding values is difficult. Yeah. And the, the issue with the linked list is that it gets rid of that's the issue that the array list has, but takes on a, an issue with processing, like uh, finding values in it. Yeah, well, let's go back to your array list uh, question. You said it's difficult. Um, that's the double-edged sword. It's easy for the programmer, because we don't know any different. If we want to add a value to an array list, we just say add a value. And the array list does all the, the, the work. Sorry. Under the hood, yes, it's difficult. It's doing destructive stuff. Um, where a linked list, adding a value for the programmer is convenient, just like an array list. I just say, hey, I want to add a value. And it just magically does it. But under the hood, the linked list, adding an element is, is easy. We're just saying I need enough space somewhere in memory for this one element, which should be pretty easy to find, right? It might be difficult to find a hundred buckets in a row in memory, potentially. Let's say you don't have that much memory. Um, you have a hundred buckets in a row. That might be difficult to ask the operating system to give me contiguous memory capable of holding a hundred things. But you might be able to find 100 individual places in memory that can each hold one thing that you're asking less of memory. Okay? Instead of building the gigantic mansion in a, a neighborhood, you wanna build five separate houses in a neighborhood. You might be able to find plots of land for five normal size houses, but you might not be able to find a plot of land for one gigantic house. Does that make sense? So from the programmer's perspective, an, a linked list versus an array list doesn't make our life any easier or harder. We just say, I wanna add a value and it magically occurs. Under the hood, a link list would do that very efficiently and easily um, at the cost of traversing that list having slower performance, where an array list would do it destructively. But it goes the other direction too. We're, I'm saying that traversing a link list is uh, slow because you have to start at the beginning and go to bucket four, but nothing keeps, I mean, link list has a method called get, where I just say I wanna get bucket two. I don't care how we got there. <laughs> that's that's the under the hood code. Who cares that it had to start here at the beginning, start knocking on doors, get to the next house, start knocking on doors. That didn't change my life at all. You know, I didn't care how slow it was. My computer's really fast and this guy is, you know, my minion. He does whatever I tell him to do and I don't care if it's hard work. Okay. So um, using an array list would be a, uh, versus a linked list would be uh, a matter of Yeah, and, and and probably the the correct so the blanket statement would be always use the correct tool for the job. That would be the blanket statement. The problem is is the correct tool for the job might change over time. If we went back into the 1980s, the correct tool for some jobs would be prohibitive to use array lists. Link lists were the only way to accomplish this because we didn't have a whole bunch of memory floating around. Okay. Um, on top of that, our computers weren't as fast as they were today. So even if we did have enough memory uh, to accommodate it, maybe speed would be more noticeable. Today, we got an abundance of memory and an abundance of speed. So the right tool for the job today might be might come more from a productivity perspective. So you might say, look, I can sit here and screw around with picking the right way of holding my collection or I can just say, I'm really comfortable with array lists, or I'm really comfortable with linked lists, even though they're basically identical, and just say, that's the tool I typically use for storing stuff, so I'm just gonna use it. I don't care what's happening under the hood. This is gonna let me get the project done accurately and quickly. That maybe becomes more of the right tool for the job. And every now and then, you're gonna bump into a problem similar to what we ran into with uh, fractions, uh, reducing the fraction with the greatest common divisor where you might run into something where you kind of get tripped up and find out that, oh, efficiency actually was kind of important in this problem. And that comes with experience where maybe you can see that ahead of time. But 99% of the time, you know, if your boss didn't look at your code, your code's gonna run the exact same human measurement of time, whether you're using the destructive array list or the um, linked list 
or maybe even just say I'm going to build an array that has a million buckets in it. I might only use five of them, but who cares? A million's probably plenty. <laughs> Something like that. I mean, that's human problem solving in and of itself, isn't it? You know, buy the biggest house you could afford and then figure out how to fill it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you look at retiring and you want to downsize and you realize you have too much junk. That's why you have garage sales. <laughs> so it's the human way. But that does connect right back to the way we do solve problems in real life and that we it's whatever the right tool for the job and that might change depending on the nature of the problem we're solving or the equipment it's running on. If you're running something on a circuit board that's made to run a dishwasher, you're going to be dealing with less RAM and all sorts of less speed. So you might have to make some calls that are a little bit more computer science-y. Where if you're running it on a general purpose computer, who cares? Yeah. The book talks about each node being its own like, an instance, of, instance of an object. Yep. So, so you can either have like a huge linked list with each node being an object, but it also says you can have a linked list with just like three objects and it'll keep track of the same amount of elements. I don't know how that would work. Well, here, let me show you. So, well, here, we had a fraction and a fraction held on to an int numerator and an int denominator. Right, and then it had some functions that did some stuff, right? Now, what we're talking about here is a node that holds on to an int payload, that's the value it holds, and a node pointer next node. So that's the node object. It holds two, in this case, it holds two pieces of information. Sometimes we have this thing called a doubly linked list, where we'd also have a node called prev node. And actually, the linked list itself is an object. And this guy has a node pointer called head. And some of them have a node pointer called tail. Where head always points to the front of the list, tail always points to the end of the list. And head will point to the very first node that lives in there. So it's a collection of instances where each instance holds a payload, a next node, and a previous node. And if you're the tail, next node will be null. Um, if you are the uh, head, previous node would be null. And next node would be null if you're only in a one list and you're the, you're the head. So um, does that make sense on how these guys are all objects? There's nothing different about nodes versus fractions other than their name. It's an object that holds stuff. Okay, now what do you mean by a uh, linked list holding three things and it being kind of the same thing? objects can manage 20 items rather than having 20 different objects. Okay. So that is kind of maybe a hybrid implementation that I was talking about earlier, which might be a way that you can implement an array list in a less ghetto way, where you might have an object that maybe controls 20 elements, like you're saying. And when you run out of stuff there, you create another object that has 20 elements in it and have the first object linked to that. That when you hit the end of this guy, jump to the next section of my storage, you know, kind of off-site storage. Uh, car dealerships kind of have that, right? They have, you go to a car dealership, they have their lot right there, but then they might say, oh, we actually do have that car. It's in a, one of our other lots and they have to go pick it up or something like that. And that's remote storage. They know the address of where that other lot is and that lot has a collection of cars as well. Um, something like that. But the important thing is from the reading and I think what I'm getting from this is, if I can just distill it down to one thing, is there's nothing new here. We are creating objects that hold stuff. So think of a linked list as a Lego. Think of a node as a Lego. Think of a fraction as a Lego. What we're changing here is how we're putting these Legos together to talk to each other, to, to do, solve different problems. Right? If you're building a castle out of Legos, you configure those Legos in such a way um, 
you know, and use maybe different style Legos to build a castle where if you're building something completely different, you would put those, you would arrange those Legos in a different organization, even though they're all Legos. All right, that makes some sense. So what they're talking about with linked lists, they're just giving you some various approaches to store stuff that is different than just contiguous storage. And talking about maybe some of the pros and cons, and that gets back to his comment about is one better than the other? And it ultimately comes down to the statement of always use the best tool for the job. And sometimes the best tool for the job is, hey, I want to get this done in five minutes, so let's just bang something out real quick. And who cares how memory inefficient it is? That makes sense? All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to basically back burner link lists and things like that because that's we basically spend a bunch of time in the next class on that specifically. And I promise you they're not hard. Um, where things start getting sketch, and I've given you warnings about this all along, is memory is intimidating for uh, inexperienced programmers. The second you start dealing with crazy looking memory addresses, you start freaking out. Okay. When it's actually so much simpler than human addresses, where we have a street, a city, you know, all this other stuff. This goes way back to first week of 200. We're too good at solving problems that we have trouble breaking it down and something that looks a little bit different to us, even though I'm telling you it's far simpler, immediately is intimidating. Okay, um, so you'll get plenty of practice with this, but for right now, we're just going to use our ghetto array list that says, hey, I'm just going to build an array list and we're just going to let whatever's under the hood handle the destructive nature of array lists and move on with life. Okay, now I mentioned last class that we were going to uh, disprove something that Pastor Smith said in um, uh, chapel. Um, and it's it's a funny thing. It's not a we're not disproving a Bible verse or something. It's a um, it's it's a uh, some a, a life decision he made. So he talked about when he graduated from college, uh, he wanted to join the alumni association at the college he went to. Okay, so when you graduate from, uh, you need help. Ninja, ninja. <laughs> oh, there's usually tips provided. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so when you graduate from Concordia, after you get your master's degree for hopefully most of you, um, uh, I've talked to several of you about that, but go and get a master's degree. It doesn't take very much longer, and it'll increase your long time savings by just ridiculous amounts of money. And it's related to what we're doing here, because you'll see the cost of the value of investing. All right, so, um, but... The Alumni Association of Concordia is going to start sending you mail and stuff of that saying, hey, come back and support your alma mater, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and they're going to want some money from you, right? To, you know, make sure you're in the loop and you have that, you know, you, your, your campus card still works. You can use the library and all sorts of other amazing things. All right. So in any case, when he um, graduated from college, he had an option. He can have a one-time fee. Um, for a lifetime membership, okay? Um, now I'm just using rough numbers because they didn't actually give numbers, but I'm gonna assume that, it, that his thing was either, because he said it, the broke break even point for him was uh, in 13 years, okay? So I'm gonna assume that he had the option for a lifetime membership was 1,300 bucks or a yearly membership is a hundred bucks in perpetuity. Okay, because what he was talking about in a sermon was basically that once he hit year thirteen, he regretted not doing the lifetime membership um, because, in actuality, uh, now he has next year he's paying another hundred bucks. Now he's at fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred. 1700 so on and so forth when he could have just locked in at 1300 day one and moved on with life yeah. and by the time he's a thousand years old he still had only outlaid 1300 bucks all right so what we want to do is we want to create a simulation that proves that he made the right decision by going year to year with this 
All right, we're going to do this based on kind of uh, um, a simple investment uh, uh, type thing. So typically when we think about investments, and I'm not teaching you about investments here, but this is more like an investment calculator you might find online. Um, I have pretty big background in this kind of stuff as well, but that's not what this class is about. But we might say we have an investment, all right? And typically we can assume an investment, assume 8% return per year, let's say. So if you put $100, into a account and you invest it, you can expect that after 10 years, you've averaged 8% compounded on that, in, uh, on that investment. The reality is, is very rarely will you actually get 8%. You'll get 20% and you'll lose 4%, you know, stuff like that. So it's kind of all over the place, but over time we can assume we have an 8% return, all right? Punchline being, don't invest money you're gonna need in a week. You know, you invest money that you're going to retire off of, you might need in 10 years or 15 years or something like that, because now you've given it time to you know, do the, the shimmies, right? <laughs> the, the, the back and forth shimmies. But we're going to assume for our simple model here, an 8% return over time. We've got 13 years to work with, so we'll assume that over those 13 years, he got the, the roughly the 8% return, okay? So we want to model, on one hand, what would happen if you took $1,300 day one and invested it, um, what would that be worth at the end of 13 years? Uh, that, that's, that's model one, right? And then we want to look at, well, what would happen if instead we invested $100 once per year over that same period of time? Because his contention was, rather than paying $100 every year, I should have just paid $1,300 uh, up front, okay? But if he paid $1,300 up front to the alma mater, that means he has $1,300 less to invest day one, all right? That would sit there for 13 years. So we're gonna have two different investments here. We're gonna have one investment that allows him to uh, invest, uh, you know, pay $100 a year, you know, to, to, to this thing. And at the end of 13 years, he would have paid $1,300, right? At the end of 40 years, he would have paid $4,000, okay? But now we want to extrapolate our initial investment of just saying, rather than paying the $1,300, I'll just go ahead and skip along at $100 per year. We'll even deduct the $100 from our investment and just let it keep growing. So we're going to look at this from a couple of different angles. All right, so we're trying to ask the question, should he have spent $1,300 day one or should he have invested $1,200, right? Spend a hundred for the first year, take the rest of the money and invest in it. But we're gonna start off by just solving the investment problem, All right? So we're gonna create some objects that allow us to um, have an investment. So we have an object model for investment calculator, let's say. So we need to decide if we kind of view this as like a, a play or something like that. Who are the actors and actresses that are in our uh, investment model here, you know, in, the, in this play? Well, we're probably going to have an object called an investment. And this guy might be a collection of... Um, contributions okay we have a collection of contributions in our uh, single investment uh, model where he just puts in twelve hundred dollars day one and waits for 13 years um, there will only be a single contribution added to our array list probably right but in a situation where maybe he invests on an ongoing basis over time and then looks at what it is after 13 years he might have 10 12 13 individual investments if he invests, you know, individual contributions if he invests per year. Make sense? So investment is going to be a collection of contributions and it's going to mean, uh, uh, keep track of a current balance taking yearly 
interest. Actually, what I'm going to do, since we think about compounding, we're going to do monthly average compounding. So it would be 8% divided by 12. Taking current balance, taking uh, monthly interest into consideration. All right. Just in case your contributions were the, the lowest thing our guy's going to support is uh, monthly contributions. All right. So, you know. We can't cont contribute to an R calculator once every four days or something like that. We're, we're going to say, look, you can do up to 12 contributions a year um, because we're only giving you interest based on per month um, situations. Okay, so we have an investment. It's going to be a collection of contributions, which ultimately is going to add up to a pool of money that we've collected from our contributions. And we're going to be applying interest to that pool of money over a period of months that it's uh, existed for, okay? So now, we ask the thing, what's a contribution? Contribution is gonna be an amount and a timestamp, all right? And what we're gonna do for our timestamp, we're gonna use simple timestamps. We're just gonna say month number. All right, where our investment lasts a total number of months. So if you have um, 13 years of investment, you would have, uh, what, 144, 50, 156, 156 months of uh, potential contributions, 156 months of investments over 13 years. All right, so a contribution will be attached to a month number and when it was, when it was given. Okay, so that's what we're gonna, we're gonna start off with a simple model like this. We're gonna, we're gonna create an investment object and that investment object is gonna hold a collection of contributions. So as soon as we see the idea of a collection, we know we need one of our things that can hold collections. And we don't know, do we know how many contributions we're gonna make over the lifetime of this investment? No. Nope, so what's the right tool for that job? Probably an array list. Array yep. No. We know there's some better things out there, but out of our two options right now, we have an array or we have an array list. An array is going to require us to say we know exactly how many contributions we're going to have. Or we have a maximum number of contributions we may ever have. Where an array list just says, hey, right now you got zero contributions. Contribute when you're ready. Okay. Uh, even though under the hood it's doing horrible stuff, <laughs> but, you know, we don't see it, so it's fine. All right, so we're going to start writing um, this model. So let's go and look at an investment object a little closer. So an investment object is going to have an array list of contribution objects. And it's going to keep track of a current value. Um, and we also could maybe keep track of, it might be helpful to keep track of um, uh, total contributions, right? That's separate from the current value. Because a lot of times when you look at an investment, you might be interested in saying, well, I, over the lifetime of this, I've contributed $2,000, and now it's actually worth $12,000, right? You might want to see those two numbers, okay? So maybe we say uh, total, you know what? We're going to calculate that. That's going to be a function. So we're going to call this get total contributions which will spit out the total money ever contributed. Current value, what we can actually do is we can say get current get current value, let's make this a function as well. This guy goes through all contributions 
and applies interest on a monthly basis. Spitting out a total current value of the investment given time and interest. All right, that makes sense? All right, so that's what we're gonna say an investment is. Now we're gonna look at what is a contribution. Okay, well, a contribution is gonna keep track of an amount. It's gonna keep track of a month number. And we're gonna go ahead and have the, we'll, we'll just hard code in the month number rather than it, like create a timestamp from a date object and stuff like that. Well, we can upgrade this secondarily. But right now we're gonna say on in month one, we're, we're uh, investing $100. In month uh, 13, we're gonna invest $100. In month 17, we'll invest $100, so on and so forth. We'll just give it a hard-coded number for what month, based off of the, the, the birth of our investment, are we giving it some money to keep things relatively simple, all right? So we're going to have objects of type contribution that will be stored in an array list within a single in, in single investment. All right, so far so good. All right, so let's build these guys out so we kind of have our model here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a new Java project. And we're gonna call this guy an investment calculator. All right, and this guy is going to give me this empty source folder. So I'll go ahead and do my usual. So I'll put a new class in here. I'll call this guy driver. Now, assuming you've already gotten to the point where you've mastered the writing the main method, the public static void main string array args, system that out that println hello world, there is a little helpful thing here where you can say, which stubs would you like to create? You can click this thing that says, go ahead and create main for me and hit finish and it will give you a generated main. I'm not encouraging you to use that until you can write this main method from memory with 100% accuracy. And at some point, probably on a midterm, I will ask you to write an error-free hello world program. So you should be able to write this program right here. All right. So if I asked you on an exam, or maybe I should say when I asked you on the exam <laughs> to write a error-free hello world program, I want the entire program, that is a class. You can name it whatever you want. We've typically called our, the, the class that drives our program, we have typically called it driver. That guy, all programs begin and end with main, so that guy must have a public, static, void, main, string array. You can change this variable name if you want, but I encourage you to just leave it as args uh, because that's kind of the traditionally what you'll see. Um, Opening curly brace, do some stuff. In this case, print out hello world. Closing curly brace. All right. This is a good way to start any Java project. That way, when you hit play and you see hello world, you know that your stuff is working. You're starting off with a, with a good baseline. All right. All of you in here should be able to do that from memory at any point in time. We should be able to stop you in the hall with a dry erase board and just say, write hello world. Okay. Well, and let me give you a legitimate lesson. I messaged you yesterday. Had you replied yet? Yes. Okay. I, I hadn't, didn't see your reply. Did they ask you to write that on the board? No, they actually didn't really have me do 
much as far as like actual like showing off. Mm -hmm. They kind of just like ask what stuff I've done in the past. Okay. Um, specific questions, I'd say. Well, well here's the reason for it. The reason I asked that is I had dinner with um, a former uh, grad student. Uh, his name is Van Nguyen. He's a Vietnamese guy. Um, really smart programmer. But he had an interview with them as well uh, for the internship. Now, he was walking into this thing with a, dis a language disadvantage, right? You know, English being not being his first language and I'd give him like maybe a, a C minus, and that's probably being nice with his English skills. Um, and he knows that's a weakness, right? But he also got very nervous. So he gets to this uh, interview, and they asked him to write a function to reverse a string on the board. They also asked him to write, funny enough, not lying, fizzbuzz on the board. You know, the, the evenly divisible by three and five, print out fizz buzz. Evenly divisible by three, print out fizz. Evenly divisible by five, print out buzz. Otherwise, just print out the number. That assignment we had. He couldn't do either of them. He locked up. He was nervous in the thing. And anyway, so it happens, right? Um, I know that he knows how to write that stuff. But the point is, is that having those couple of go-to moves, he knew how to write the logic. He forgot how to write a for loop. Mostly because he was nervous, Right. But you need to be able to create some sort of starting structure for a couple of those go-to moves uh, when you're writing something. So if you're in an interview and they ask you to print out all the numbers between 1 and 100, you should have that for loop ready to go. And then it's just a matter of how do I print in that language or something like that. Okay? So there's certain things that are worth memorizing just to give you a baseline for starting a, uh, uh, a project. All right, make some sense? All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna create a new class and we're gonna create a class called investment. And uh, let's see, we have not talked about public private protected yet. The book probably has, but we have it. Okay, so I'm not going to include that in this, we'll upgrade it the next time around. Um, and I'll talk about that in class. Um, so an investment, we decided, is going to have an array list of contributions. So before I fill in investment here, I'm going to go ahead and create my other object. So I'm going to create a new class called a contribution. All right. And we decided a contribution is going to have two things in it. It's going to have an amount. Um, let's just keep it whole numbers. Instead of contributing $100.16, we'll just make them put in whole numbers. So we're going to say we have an amount, and then we also have a month number. And we'll go ahead and create our constructor for this guy. And this guy will take in an amount and a month number, and we'll set this dot amount equal to the amount that was passed in, this dot month number equal to the month number that was passed in all right so that's the information we need to store for our contribution this is a data structure that knows how to hold things related to a contribution it's not one of our traditional data structures like linked lists or binary trees or stacks or queues or things like this but it's a data structure that we need for this project okay so that's what a contribution is going to be now I'll go back to an investment and we need a collection of contributions. So I'm going to create an array list capable of holding a contribution. We'll call this guy the contributions. And then in my constructor for investment, I'll go ahead and set the contributions equal to a new array list of type contribution. So at this point, I have zero contributions in this guy, right? I have a nice empty, uh, empty list there. All right. So now, oh, it's wanting me to make sure I import java.util for my array list. Okay. So that's what an empty investment is going to be. Go ahead. Um, array list is an object, right? Mm-hmm. How do you know it probably is? Capital R. Yep. And then you would, you would 
Yeah, so what I did here is you could have actually put this up here, but since a constructor is usually meant for initializing an object, I said we will have a variable of type array list for the contributions. And during the constructor, I'll actually give that guy his value. I initialized him in the constructor. This is more, let's call it programming practice rather than uh, a necessity. You could have put the equals new thing up here. But I like having our field list up here and then initializing those fields inside of the constructor. That's a pretty common go-to move, let's say. All right, so now we want to have the ability um, to add a contribution to my array list of contributions. All right, so I have a function here called add contribution. It's going to take in a contribution. It's going to add it to my array list of contributions. All right. Then we decided in our list here that we wanted to have a get current value and a get total contributions. So get total value is going to return an int. Um, you know what? For contribution here, I am going to change this to a double. For the amount because once we start uh, applying 8% to it it's going to start giving us uh, things that are outside events all right so we're going to have a double get current value this guy should return the current value of this investment taking time and an average of 8% yearly or 0.67% monthly return. And then we'll have get total contributions. This returns the total amount ever invested, not taking into account interest. All right, so your homework is to write these two functions. I'll give you this as a starting point. And what I'll go ahead and do just as your little sample thing here is we're gonna create an initial investment with a single contribution of $1,200. All right, so I'll create a contribution. C is equal to new contribution. And I'm gonna pass it 1,200 and month one as my input there, I misspell contribution. Contribute. Huh. Well, I'll get that fixed up. Um, so I wonder why it's not linked, but in any case, uh, did I not save the thing? Huh? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll, yeah, that's, yeah, I should have known. That's their hello world one. So I'll go ahead. I'm going to create an initial contribution of $1,200, add that to my investment, and then you should be able to show what is that worth at the end of, for example, 13 years, something like that. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a link on GitHub. Yep. So if you had uh, $1,200 after the first month, you would multiply that by 
0.0067, so you'd have $1,208.04. After that first month, so you would do that times you know for each individual month moving forward. All right, don't forget we have the student get together uh, right down the hall. Prizes, trivia, free food, all that stuff starts at eleven thirty. So head down there, and I'll be down in a minute.